Good morning, everyone, and thank you again uh, for this kind of opportunity to present on the evaluation of new tools and techniques for acute uh, stroke treatment. I've been with you uh, virtually the entire time, and I have to say the content of the program has just been uh, spectacular. Uh, these are my disclosures relevant to this uh, particular talk. Um, I am a paid consultant for Route 92 Medical, which I will talk a little bit about their device, uh, but the majority of what I'm presenting was actually funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, I'm a preclinical guy, so I never get to name clinical trials. I'm always impressed at how creative all of you are in the audience to make really catchy names. And what I'd like to pr promote is faster, um, meaning first pass, ticky three, easy to use with reliable results. Um, I will spend quite a bit of this talk talking about um, the resurgence of neuroprotection. So what, what's going on with new devices? Um, I think, and I'm just showing one example here, which is the Route 92 High Point catheter that's delivered over a, a dilator called Tenzing, but there's others available as well. Um, there's the Perfuse system, and there's also a bioimperative care, the Zoom 88. I think getting the largest possible tube to aspirate the clot is really going to be a uh, enormous advance in the field. And this is why, so I'm showing on the left here, this is a typical 070. So you take a small, basically biopsy of the clot, and then you cork this thing, you try to pull it out and you rely on the cohesive forces of the clot uh, to stay together and they don't, they fragment. So you have distal normalization. Here we're showing delivering a large tube. So the tensing is placed just in the proximal aspect of the clot. You advance this large O88 system. And as you pull the tensing out, it's very similar to pulling a syringe plunger and you completely ingest the clot without ever having crossed uh, the clot. And uh, we have evaluated this in vitro in our model system, and uh, we have shown that it has very high first pass complete recanalization. So 90% in our very fragment rich clot, you compare that to only 20% with the standard thrombectomy systems, the 070s and the 068s. Um, with soft clot, it was 100% first pass recanalization. And what you see is really, if we take these data and put it in composite, um, it's an exponential function as a, a, a function of diameter. So in other words, complete clot ingestion is exponentially related to the ID of the tube that you deliver. Um, so of course, if you don't cross the clot and you get complete ingestion, what I call the hoovering effect, you completely hoover the clot into uh, the aspiration catheter. Um, you have very little distal embolization, none in the large fragments and, and very little in the small uh, category. And the question is, does this translate clinically? I think it does. I think our in vitro modeling in general does very well for clinical prediction. And so here is just an example of a case. You can see the tensing just placed in the proximal aspect of the clot, the large O88 tube being delivered over that tensing. And as you withdraw the tensing, um, it's very likely that you have complete clot ingestion. And when we tracked it, we did this work uh, with Ricardo, as well as uh, with Gary Dabu in the first 33 patients, uh, consecutive patients that were treated with this technique we called slick, super large bore ingestion um, uh, completely of the clot. Uh, we had 100% success in, in getting the, the device to the site of the occlusion. Um, of course, there might be some patient selection bias. Obviously, you're not going to take this large O88 tube and put it deep into an artery that can't accommodate the device. Um, but in the selected patients, 100% success in delivering the catheter. Um, Ticky 2B, which is uh, equal to or greater than Ticky 2B, which has previously been defined as success, was achieved in the first pass in 82% of the cases. Um, but the true uh, first pass effect, which is Ticky, um, modified Ticky, greater than or equal to 2C was 71%. And this is in the first uh, experience. I think that's going to improve as we have more cases uh, available. <clears throat> Uh, what about stent retrievers? Um, this, the Tiger 13 is quite an exciting device. It's a very small, can be delivered quite distally, um, and it's constrainable. So you activate um, the expansion and compression of the device, and you can use that to try to facilitate uh, better clot incorporation into the device. The Thrombeck system is really exciting. It's um, basically two baskets that you can articulate. So you can literally sandwich the clot in between these two baskets and, and hopefully get complete uh, recanalization. We've so shown in vitro that it does uh, have a very high recanalization and, excuse me, reduces uh, distal MLI. Um, and then there's something we're working on with a group in France called Capto. It's a really exciting device. It actually uses peptides that bind to nets, which are neutrophil uh, extracellular traps, which we know are abundant in emboli that cause acute ischemic stroke. And so it's actively grabbing onto the clot. So you can imagine the system we've measured again in vitro that it has a reduction of distal emboli and has a very high recanalization rate. But 
if you take what, you know, Jan Grala estimate last year presented the results of the Swift Direct study, uh, which is using really the first generation thrombectomy system, the solitaire. And what I uh, took upon that, regardless of the true intent of the trial, was what impressed me, the rate of achieving successful recanalization, so that that's defined, unfortunately, as MT2B or greater, was 97%. So I think with these new devices, we're going to see very high first pass TIKI 2C3. Um, so the question is, is thrombectomy really the challenge? And maybe it is for Mevos and Vivos, but if you talk about the traditional large vessel occlusion, I think the problem, and, and as an engineer, I, I say this with a bit of trepidation, it's largely solved. Um, so really maybe we should turn our attention back to the brain. And uh, of course the era of neuroprotection, it's almost a dirty word and stroke. It was a disaster, uh, billions of dollars spent with no good clinical outcomes or clinical uh, effect. Um, but that was in the absence of reperfusion. I think if we need to really reevaluate neuroprotection in the paradigm of successful recanalization or revascularization. And I think this is a landmark study uh, being run by Mike Hill and, and Mayank Goyal. Um, the escape NA1 ultimately was negative, but this is giving the retinide, which is a neuroprotective drug developed by Mike Tomiansky. And uh, although the trial was negative, if you do the subgroup analysis, it turns out that patients that got IV, IV thrombolysis um, with a plasminogen activator, um, the plasmin actually cleaved the drug. So when the, the, the IV TPA was given, um, it, it, it inhibited the effect of the drug. So if you look at the patients that didn't receive intravenous thrombolysis, there actually was a therapeutic benefit of giving neuretinide uh, with, um, uh, I'm sorry, giving neuretinide in the setting of thrombectomy. So uh, the ESCAPE NEXT trial is ongoing. I think the results will be in very soon. And I do expect that that'll be the first a positive trial that combines a reperfusion strategy with neuroprotection. And that will hopefully set the standard of care to be uh, to combine these strategies. Um, some work that we're doing, we're focused with a company called Focal Cool, uh, again, funded by the NIH to uh, study the effect of focal um, hypothermia. Um, as we know, systemic hypothermia is fraught with lots of problems, but the question is, can we use our, the fact that you are selectively in the target organ, can we use your catheter systems to deliver a cooling agent um, in conjunction with thrombectomy? And will that produce a benefit? The, the fundamental problem is if you take cold saline, as John Pyle Spellman is the world's leading expert on this, if you take cold saline and infuse it through a catheter, unfortunately, you get about one and a half meters that's inside a, a 37 degree water bath. Um, so unfortunately, if you inject cold saline through, it's, it's really going to be warm. Um, but if you take an insulated catheter, we can see that uh, depending, of course, on flow rate, uh, preservation of the coolant so that we can really reduce temperature. And this has been studied in China, uh, just using a cold saline approach without an insulated catheter. And it has shown, you know, the beginnings of potentially reducing the infarct volume by doing this uh, uh, cooling uh, to the target organ. So we're going to study our insulated catheter so that we can preserve the cooling effect um, in a temporary occlusion of the middle cerebral artery in dogs with a coil. This was published by the Ohio State Group back in 2007, so we adopted their model. Uh, we started cooling 45 minutes after creating a complete occlusion. The occlusion was then removed, simulating thrombectomy, and then cooling was continued for 15 minutes. We, we broke this into two phases. Our phase one study, we just we, we measured invasively with thermocouples in the brain. Uh, the effect of cooling in that uh, target organ. And then we did a chronic experiment where we um, uh, did the full cooling, survived the animals, and looked at neurological outcomes as well as imaging outcomes. And here you can see the model. So, you know, we uh, basically go through the posterior circulation to the middle cerebral artery with our microcatheter. We place a coil causing a complete middle cerebral artery occlusion. This is a very challenging model, but uh, we were successful. Um, and then we, uh, in our phase one, we delivered two degree uh, um, uh, saline at a flow rate of 20 to 40 uh, ml per minute. And we cooled the ipsilateral brain to about 28 degrees. So you can see here's the data on the ipsilateral side to where we're infusing the cooling agent. We have dramatic cooling, very deep, sharp, short duration cooling. Uh, on contralateral side, there was a small dip and systemically there was a very small change that could be uh, just due to uh, having an animal under general anesthesia and trying to maintain its temperature. But um, systemically, there was no significant change in temperature, but in the in, uh, contralateral side, a small change. And on the ipsilateral side, where we're delivering a cooling agent, we really get a profound cooling of the organ. 
And uh, so here's an example in our phase two study where we have the occlusion, we do the uh, cooling, uh, the acute MRI, just really a small bits here. 48 hours later, you see some edema um, of that ischemic lesion. Uh, here's a control animal with a complete MCA territory infarction. Um, and what we found, a very small sample size, but in our controls, the average infarct value was about four cc's, which is quite large in the brain of a dog. Um, in the cooling, um, we did see a small change in core temperature, which was not significant. Um, we did have a small drop of hematocrit because we're giving a substantial uh, volume of fluid, um, about 5%, but the infarct volume was, was really an order of magnitude smaller than in the controls. And, and, and the three animals that we were successful in, there was no deficit on the 30-day neurological exam. We just recently completed, not published, a confirmatory study where four animals in each group of focal hypothermia versus control. Um, and what we found is that the infarct evolution was changed. So in other words, the blue areas here were the completed infarct at the one, immediately after the cooling experiment. And then we continued imaging and we watched the evolution of the infarct and that's in red. And uh, you can see very small expansion in the animals that were cooled as compared to here, we had a very small infarct in a control animal, but that continued to evolve. So it seems like cooling arrested the evolution of the infarct. And of course, this was a highly statistically significant. This is the growth of the infarct over that time period. And you can see in the controls, it was much higher than in the uh, animals that received cooling. Um, what about, I think this is a super exciting uh, target, which is uh, at our institution, I'll give you an example, it's a hospital 15 minutes away, it's a primary stroke center, not thrombectomy capable, associated with our system. So patient gets imaged, and despite the fact they're only 15 miles away, it's routine. And I know Demetrius has, has done a great job this morning in addressing the systems of care. I, it's such a challenge. It takes us easily one and a half to two hours to get that patient from a hospital very close by to uh, the thrombectomy procedure at our hospital. So maybe robotics or maybe um, AI algorithms will direct patients to the uh, center. But what I'm wondering is if we can't just give a drug to buy the brain to arrest the infarct evolution by the brain more time, that might not be a more uh, pragmatic approach. And so, again, this is the, the model that we're using. We're, we're going to create a permanent occlusion in the canine. Uh, we're going to do this by an autologous injection of a clot into the internal carotid artery. This was a technique taught to me by a good friend, Ali Shabani. This actually has a very rich history in the field of stroke. Uh, before we had the rodent models, the dog model was the primary model of acute ischemic stroke uh, developed by uh, Hill in the 1950s and, and uh, pursued by Molinari in the 1970s. Um, of all of our animal modeling, this is the most reliable technique. We put a six French catheter at the origin of the internal carotid artery. We inject an autologous embolus uh, made of the dog's own blood, and it routinely, uh, consistently occludes the middle cerebral artery. So here's angiographic, uh, both lateral and AP projections. You can see here the left middle cerebral artery before the clot is injected and after the clot is injected. And we have complete occlusion of the M1 segment. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And uh, we, we follow this in MRI to make sure that the segment uh, continues to be occluded. Um, so here I'm showing uh, the occlusion again. The biggest problem I had with our canine model is the variability. And this is, again, described throughout history, the variability of the infarct size. So for years, when I would have uh, applied to the NIH to use this model, uh, you know, they're like the variability of the infarct is so large that you're gonna need hundreds of animals, it's just impractical. And I, I hired a really smart MR physicist, uh, Mohammed Shazib, and uh, uh, Mohammed told me, Matt, there's two distinct evolution patterns. And the problem is you're combining all the data. Um, so he said, look, we have this fast progressors that dramatically, um, uh, their infarct progresses very quickly. And we have these slow evolvers that seem to hang on for a while before they have uh, the infarct growth. And what is really special about what Salman did was he was able to use a perfusion sequence that, you know, when we create the embolus, and he was able to show that uh, with perfusion imaging, I can predict which animal is going to be fast and which animal is going to be slow. And why that's important is if we're going to do a drug study, we need to randomize fast versus fast and slow versus slow for both the placebo uh, treatment and the drug treatment. So this was a really important discovery in our lab. 
laboratory and um, it, he's able to do this reliably. And now I'm showing, I'm giving an oxygen carrier. So typically your hemoglobin dumps the oxygen around 40% tension, right? So if we wanna get those pumps working in the ischemic penumbra, we need to tune that down to let's say five, 10%. So what we do is we, we give this oxygen carrier and what I'm showing here in red is the progression of the infarct over time. Um, and in red, it's, it's a vehicle treatment. So um, there's a really rapid uh, uh, evolution of this infarct. And then in the yellow line is the dogs that got drug. Um, and you can see that we can push this infarct evolution to the right, so we can buy the brain time. And if we look at the half point of the half of, of the infarct progression, you can buy uh, about an hour of brain um, so I think that this is a really viable and maybe pragmatic strategy uh, for those patients who are um, not in a thrombectomy center. And you can see for the entire duration of our imaging, uh, this is all done by diffusion weighted MRI. And we do um, analysis of the ADC, so quantitative analysis of infarct progression. And it, it correlates perfectly with our histological when we study the mitochondria um, uh, death. Uh, so. Uh, we're very confident in this technique. And, and what was also interesting is that even by the end of our five-hour observation, the infarct had not completed. Um, so we really think that this is a potential strategy to buy brain time. And then in blue, you see our slow evolvers with vehicle treatment. Um, and you can see that, again, we can also shift the curve, even in slow evolvers, about 45 minutes uh, to the right uh, at the halfway infarct point. <laughs> Uh, we are really excited that we're now able to actually perform a mechanical thrombectomy in a brain of an animal. Um, so here I'm showing microcatheterization of the middle cerebral artery, deployment of either the small tiger system or a baby Trevo, and we can actually do a recanalization experiment. Here's uh, the uh, post-thrombectomy image um, where we're able to create a Tiki 2C uh, outcome. And if we look at the perfusion imaging, this is prior to doing a thrombectomy, you see this large area at risk. And then this is post thrombectomy with one small area of hyperperfusion, probably related to the distal emboli after the thrombectomy. So why do we need a, a sophisticated uh, thrombectomy preclinical model? Because I think the ultimate solution is going to be a complex one. I think it's going to couple neuroprotection. And I don't just mean neuroprotection, uh, one drug like norentinide. I think it's gonna be a cocktail of drugs um, that are coupled with the pre-thrombectomy, post-thrombectomy uh, setting, um, it potentially including uh, focal uh, cooling of the brain. Um, I am very encouraged by the concept of post-procedural thrombolysis. We have measured in our laboratory that Regardless of, of what incredible technique you use to open up the, the proximal vessel, there is a shower of distal emboli and most of 95% of those distal emboli are on the order of less than 50 microns. So nothing that can be addressed with a mechanical device. The question is, can you use a post-procedural thrombolysis uh, to take care of that? And there's some encouraging uh, data coming out of Europe that that might be a viable strategy. Um, and of course, post-procedural nerve protection. And I think to develop such a complex cocktail, if you think about all the knobs that we're turning simultaneously, we do need viable preclinical models to screen what is the optimal cocktail. So again, it's always an honor to uh, be with you uh, down in Jacksonville and talk about these exciting, uh, this exciting new future. But I have to say, even though I'm invited all around the world to talk about this stuff, there's a huge number of people um, who actually do the work. And I just want to highlight uh, my partner, Vanya Anagnastaku, who uh, did a lot of these experiments. Uh, uh, Robert King, who is uh, on our faculty now, he's an engineer who does a lot of the analysis. Uh, Mohammed Salman Shazib, who has been incredible in our image analysis, and a number of others, as the list goes on and on. But uh, just, again, an honor to be with you virtually. Um, and I wish you, uh, the remainder of the meeting to be uh, outstanding. Thank you so much. You there, Matt? I'm here. How are you doing, Ricardo? Awesome, man. Uh, any questions for Matt? Matt, uh, that was a very nice, uh, you, you've done the job for me because I was supposed to talk about neuroprotection and reperfusion. So you, you primed the audience very nicely. Um, and I completely agree with the, everything you said. They were kind of hitting the, the, the uh, ceiling now of what we can do 
with our mechanical thrombectomy devices that the, the next uh, focus should be protecting the brain and so on and so forth. And I think this, this uh, cooling stuff is very important because you also mentioned, and I agree with you, that um, it's unlikely that one neuroprotectant uh, working on one mechanism of the ischemic cascade will be the, the winner necessarily, that the future is probably something that will entail some kind of approach that, that uh, addresses all the aspects of the ischemic cascade. And of course, hypothermia is that you know, one of these uh, approaches. So uh, that focal cool work is, is really cool, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so one thing that the uh, Chinese group uh, that has done most of the work, uh, by the way, they're the Bao Chu people. Um, uh, they have reported that um, uh, following infusion of ice cold saline uh, in the uh, in the uh, ipsilateral carotid, that the hypothermic effect, you, you know, you infuse for 10 minutes and then you have hypothermia for another four hours afterwards. Did you notice the same phenomenon and how would you explain that? Um, Tudor, I was not aware of that. Thank you very much for bringing it to my attention. And regrettably, um... You know, I have to go back and look at all of our animal health records to see if we, we continue monitoring temperature because it's in our protocol, but I never looked at that. Um, they put probes in the brain. Yeah, so I have not done that uh, for prolonged periods of time. If you looked at our data, there was a uh, rewarming when we stopped the cooling. So no, we did not see that. And I have no understanding of the mechanism. Um, obviously, Tudor, you and I are both big fans of hypothermia. It is a known neuroprotectant. The question is, and Pat Leiden is probably one of the world's leading experts on this, what is the target temperature and for how long do you do the hypothermia? And um, I don't have those answers. Um, from a pragmatic standpoint, the way we developed our protocol was simply looking at the systemic effects of delivering large volumes of fluids, right? So that's why we did it for short duration. Uh, and we are seeing a benefit. But that was just pragmatically derived. It's not based on um, thermodynamics. So obviously, if you're pumping fluids, there's only so much you can put in. Um, so that's where we came up with our protocol. But excellent points. And there's a lot of work to be done. And I hope, I'm curious, generally, both Tudor and, and others in the audience, I do think the cocktail is going to be complex. And the question is, is it viable for clinical trials to gradually turn all the knobs. I think that that's impractical and that's why we're doing it in a preclinical setting to try to come up with an optimized protocol so that then we can translate that to clinical study. That's like the poly pill. You've seen the, the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that you give people a poly pill as opposed to separate drugs. The rate of uh, outcomes is dramatically reduced. <laughs> 